must begin with financial conflict of interest disclaimer. Okay, Father, please. It always reminded me of the movie The Grinch where it comes up and says, you know, the little girl mentioned a check and the mayor says there is no check. You know, uh, I have no financial interest or other conflicts of interest related to the material and it doesn't pay me. Well, um, thank you all for having me. Uh, thank you to Bishop Perry for celebrating Mass and for uh, being such a um, staunch supporter of, um, of all things pro-life um, and to Father Blasek for asking me to come and speak to you today. Um, as I stated, I have no disclosures to make and the topic I have been given is updates in hormonal contraception. Um, a little bit about myself, I've been in private practice since 1993. Uh, uh, I stopped prescribing contraception about 15 years ago to conform my practice to the teachings of uh, my Roman Catholic faith. Recently, I opened up a new practice in Donner's Grove after uh, being in a, another uh, practice for 20 years. And uh, I opened up uh, uh, Donner's Grove OBGYN with uh, my partner, Dr. Anthony Caruso. And um, it's a, a practice that uh, promotes fertility awareness programs of all types, um, especially the credit method and uh, natural technology, also the billing and the Marquette method. Um, if I bring any biases to the, to the table today, it would be that I do not feel that uh, a woman's fertility is a disease. I do not feel that babies should be classified as sexually transmitted diseases. And other than that, I'm a pretty mainstream ob -GYN. So, that's me. Objectives, pretty uh, ambitious, and I'm gonna try and get through this um, rather quickly, but I, my objectives are to quantify the use of hormonal contraception, a brief historical review, discuss the mechanisms of action, so, uh, modern uh, oral contraception, discuss the benefits and risk, review the contraindication, and then close with some unintended consequences that I think uh, are becoming self-evident in a society that um, has embraced uh, contraceptive, the, the contraceptive mentality. So, uh, to date myself, there used to be a uh, TV program called Dragnet, and Sergeant Joe Friday would ask the, the would come in and say, "Just the facts, ma'am." So here I am. So Joe Friday here. A, a woman will spend approximately five years of her reproductive life trying to get pregnant, and 30 years trying to avoid getting pregnant. The cost of raising a child today to age 18 is estimated uh, to be 241,000 and some change, which means that Dr. Lawler will be working forever. <laughs> the average household has 2.58 children, and in the United States, the 2010 census, there were less than uh, a thousand families in the entire country who had had 10 or more children. Babies are expensive. And uh, when you look at, at uh, the actuarial uh, data out, for governments, for every dollar spent to prevent pregnancy, governments uh, are in line to save about $5.80. So you can see that um, when the number crunchers start to talk about um, contraception and uh, economics, that's what's sort of driving the discussion. The 2001 data, I think, I, I wanted to include the 2010, but 6.4 million pregnancies, 2001, 3.1 million were unintended, 52% were not contraceptives, 48% were, and 50% of our women presenting for abortion state that they were using contraception in the month that they conceived. 
62 million women would fall within that category of reproductive age of 15 to 44. 99 percent of women had used at least one form of contraception. And it goes through all religions, but 89 percent of Catholics use a contraceptive method. 64% of Catholics use a hormonal method. Four out of five sexually active women have tried the, the, the you know, birth control pill. And 2% of Catholic women choose a fertility awareness program. This is the latest data. Numbers that have, have been shifting, and we'll talk about why. But but when we talk about these numbers, I want you to keep the numbers in mind because we're, we're going to talk about risk associated with hormonal contraception. And although the, the percentage is, is very small, if you take even a small percentage of a very large number, you get a lot of affected individuals. So 10.5 million women use the pill. 1.4 million use an injectable form of hormone and 1.3 million use another uh, mechanism of delivery, either a patch, a ring, an implant. So a total right now of 13.2 million. This is United States, not worldwide. Worldwide, the number would be between 60 and 80 million. So you can keep those numbers in mind as we um, go forward. So now I want to do a, a little brief history of how we got to where we are. I think it's good to know where we've been so as to know where we got there and try to figure out where we're going. So 1938, the first orally active estrogen and progesterone compounds were formulated. Margaret Sanger, the founder of what would be considered Planned Parenthood today, was um, actively searching for the magic pill, the magic pill to um, uh, prevent pregnancy. And there was a lot of research being done. Uh, we'll talk about how they made this orally active, but, but basically we added an ethanol group to the estradiol, which is estrogen, and that made it not only more potent, but it made it able to be consumed uh, orally and be active. The progestin component, and we're going to talk about what is the pill can, uh, comprised of, but the progestin components are derived from uh, male hormones, we call them 19 nor testosterone. And that's when we talk about the side effects of the pill, is you know, the reason why we see a lot of the side effects that we see. And that's just a list of the, the common uh, progestins that are available in the pill. So between 1950 and 1956, the, the research is picking up. In the, in the Catholic world, Pope Pius XII announced that the church will sanction the use of fertility awareness um, in, uh, great, for great reasons and reaffirmed the church's teaching against all forms of contraception. Two huge names in the development, along with, with, with Gregory Pincus and uh, Dr. Carl Dujaris, they both began working diligently on trying to figure out how to inhibit ovulation in a woman with the use of hormones, along with another um, famous physician, uh, Dr. John Rock. 1956. The pharmaceutical companies, uh, Cyril, uh, submitted Inovid uh, for FDA approval. Initially, the uh, approval was for menstrual uh, regulation. Uh, it later was uh, moved to uh, oral contraception. And then the first large clinical uh, trial was actually held in Puerto Rico, headed up by Dr. John Rock and Dr. Gregory uh, Pinkett. Uh, the first inovid pill was a 10 milligram pill. And just so you know, that's a really hot of, of progestin. It's the the, the uh, mechanism of action is kind of joked about with the, with the initial inovid pill that it was more of a medic, meaning the woman was uh, nauseous and vomiting than it was a contraceptive because uh, of the high doses 
uh, and it really was quite unacceptable to the general to the general public. You may find it interesting that there was a that the, the initial uh, studies done on the on the bill were actually there was a male bill and a female bill, and actually doses of progestin this uh, high actually can uh, inhibit uh, spermatogenesis in the male. <coughs> However, there was going to be some uh, a few male uh, Harvard students who were experiencing some testicular atrophy, and uh, that kind of put an end to the male form of the pill. On the woman's side of it, we had three or four early attributable deaths, but that was at that time considered um, you know, uh, an acceptable risk uh, going, going forward. Uh, since that time, we've been, they've been lowering the dose of the pill uh, ever, ever since. So then we're going to move to 1960 to 1965, and things are really, really uh, heating up. Uh, like I said, initially the FDA approved the, uh, and now that the first pill, um, for uh, menstrual irregularities, um, and then it got its um, final uh, FDA approval as a contraception uh, in uh, uh, 1957. So here we go. The race is on. 1.2 million women in 1962 were on the pill. There were 130, 132 reported blood clots, and there were 11 reported deaths. Um, and this was enough to have the FDA convene a special counsel at the time um, to uh, uh, really look, take a hard look at, at uh, these deaths and, and the uh, hypercoagulable state, the uh, propensity, the tendency to form clots while on the very synthetic steroid. Um, President Johnson, the, the government starts uh, looking at this very uh, closely and, and um, along the lines of Margaret Sanger and, and that group, the idea was to uh, really promote this um, amongst the, the poor of the communities uh, in um, an attempt to uh, bring down the population of, uh, in that area um, for economic reasons. And then the Cable Commission on Population was established in 1964. Um, as I mentioned, you know, these initial doses of 9.35 milligrams of progestin, um, which was in the original uh, pill, was a, really a, a massive dose. Uh, if we think about what the modern pill is today, and that's why the, uh, the uh, side effects of the initial pill were so horrendous. So 1965, some really interesting uh, events took place, but most interesting and uh, most uh, kind of under the radar was that the American College of OBGYN convened um, a uh, council to look at uh, terminology and definitions. And to put it, you know, simply, prior to 1965, pregnancy was considered established when egg and sperm met uh, and life was born, and that we considered that pregnant. After 1965, and just recently reconfirmed by the World Health Organization, the definition of pregnancy now is after implantation has completed. Uh, maybe a small little nuance, but it's, it's not. It's really, really important because as we go on later to speak about how does the birth control pill work, there is a heated debate going on here on whether or not it can act as an abortifacient. Well, depending on how you define pregnancy, um, you can 
stand up at a podium and say yes or no in regards to that uh, very important question. Um, so that, uh, and, and then and on the political side, there was this uh, case uh, basically that there were states that prohibited uh, contraception in the landmark uh, case in 1965 of Great Wall versus Connecticut, where the Supreme Court struck down that as an anti uh, uh, privacy within the marriage uh, in a 7 to 2 decision, uh, which basically uh, say, stated that. Uh, contraception uh, was legal. You can see the number has grown now to 6.5 million women at that time were on the bill. And the Vatican II Council came to a close and they had made no mention of the bill about it at that time. <coughs> That's a three-day-old human embryo on the, on the tip of a pen. And so you can see when we sit in a room and we argue about when life begins or when pregnancy is established, we don't know what this is. And, and I'll give you just the, I know what it is, but the terminology stuff. What, what they're saying is that, um, now this is the World Health Organization, which the American College of OBGYN has um, uh, also agreed with, and the federal regulations of the Department of Health have established that uh, pregnancy encompasses the period of time from confirmation of implantation through any of the presumptive signs of pregnancy, such as a mismenses. Fertilization does not establish pregnancy. Rather, fertilization is a necessary but insufficient step on the path to pregnancy. That's going to be really, really important when we talk about the morning after pill, the emergency contraception, and contraception in general. So 1967, things are, are, are progressing. The NAACP of uh, Pittsburgh uh, sues Planned Parenthood for preferentially uh, targeting minorities. In, need, in order to keep the birth rate as low as possible. And then that was termed as black genocide. And we're seeing this uh, current in, in, in 2013 and 2014 with the undercover um, uh, tapes that were uh, at local Planned Parenthood in regards to abortion counseling with a minority. The number is 12.5 million women in 67 worldwide on the bill. And the amount of data coming in suggesting that the bill may be not as safe as we would like it to be, there's a lots and lots of pressure placed on pharmaceutical companies to continually lower the dose to make it more tolerable and to decrease hopefully some of the um, unforward uh, uh, complications or risk associated with the uh, birth control bill. So it's big business, and it's big, big business today, but sales surpassed 150 million. Uh, it's becoming mainstream. Uh, comedy with David Niven and Devin Kerr, Cruz in the bill was very popular in 68. And then this, and then the Holy Father, Pope Paul VI, released this encyclical, which uh, really shocked uh, the Catholic community, both clergy and laity, because I think the feeling was, oh, the Catholic Church is going to change their position on the bill on contraception. And in Humanae Vitae, Pope Paul VI reaffirmed the Church's teaching on contraception. And like I said, the age of dissent, he really began in earnest uh, after that um, encyclical was made um, public. So here we are in America during the decade of the 80s. 10.7 million, 80% of American Catholic women. I found that interesting. 29% of American priests 
considered the bill intrinsically evil, which means 71% don't hold it in that at that time. And now that it was taken off the market in 1988, I didn't, I, I didn't, uh, what did I learn that it lasted that long? And 50 million young women worldwide were on some form of oral contraception. Now, quickly, 1998, Plan B, which is the morning after pill, was developed. It was in 2006 that Plan B was uh, given over the counter status for those women 18 and older. And in 2000, 2013, the over-the-counter status of Plan B was changed to women of child-bearing potential. So basically eliminating um, any kind of restrictions to Plan B. Then new delivery systems were making their way out, uh, which we, uh, because of the, the problem with the pill is getting, we're, we're getting women to take it on a consistent basis. And so all the new delivery systems and where the trends are, are to long-acting reversible contraceptives, IUDs, patch, anything that takes the user portion of this uh, medication and uh, eliminates it, uh, increases effect and efficacy. So the NuvaRing, the transdermal patch, and the hormone releasing IUD all made their debut in 2001. Not a hormonal contraceptive, but a form of sterilization, which really uh, was developed in 2002. This is the in office, no uh, incision, hysteroscopic coiling of the fallopian tubes. Uh, it is a very uh, lucrative procedure, technically easy to do, um, but there again, about 10 years later, a lot of problems are coming home to roost uh, in regards to women who uh, are having regret. Very difficult to reverse this. Women who are having other untoward side effects, menstrual irregularities, pelvic pain um, uh, associated with this procedure. So there again, it's, it's one of those situations where unintended consequences are making their way um, into, the, into the medical field. Just finishing up, 2006, Implanon is the new uh, sub, uh, uh, implants that go in the woman's arm. You may have remembered Norplant was the first one where we placed uh, five celastic uh, implants within the uh, uh, arm. This is just um, uh, a, a one implant. Ella, this is the emergency contraception. It works a little bit differently uh, than the uh, Plan B. It's basically impairs implantation and uh, delays or inhibits ovulation. Um, this is the latest implant, next plan, and then a new form of uh, IUD. Like I said, the trend in obstetrics and gynecology is to move away from uh, uh, a system where that relies on patient compliance. So we're trying, they're trying to make uh, all these si si systems um, uh, as simple proof as possible. So you don't have to remember to take anything. You just uh, have a device placed within your body or you wear a patch. Just uh, up uh, the street a little bit in Northwestern. Uh, they are in the process of developing an advanced contraceptive ring, which also protect against HIV and the herpes virus. It's a, a ring impregnated with an antiviral, that's the tenovir, and then legal no dress no dress all is the progesterone com component. And it's several years down the road, but they're, they're looking at you know, 
uh, Africa for uh, clinical trials and places um, as uh, their answer to um, not only the population problem as they perceive it, but also the HIV problem, which is real and prevalent in the, in the area. So, despite all the advances in hormonal and other forms of contraception, and the availability of various forms of sterilization, there has not been a significant change in the unintended pregnancy rate since 1981. And in fact, when we look at this slide, you're going to see that the unintended pregnancy rate actually went up. And so I think it's uh, time to ask the, the question why. And I think we know why is that women in general don't like being on massive doses of synthetic hormones and um, and I don't think men would uh, uh, the uh, unintended pregnancy rate um, as you can see has gone up um, so that's the history what is it the pill we're going to talk about what is it how does it work what are the proposed benefits what are the associated risks contraindications and then uh, unintended consequences I hope that uh, this is uh, dialogue and uh, don't intend to have a lot of answers but hopefully generate a lot of questions so for all the healthcare providers in the room this is a basic review it's synthetic estrogen and progesterone Talk about that all group being added to increase its biological potency. Um, and ethanol oxidile is the, really the main estrogenic component found in almost every oral contraception in the United States. The progestin component, the progesterone component, is a nine nor testosterone. We, we can all relate to testosterone, male hormone derivative. Therefore, they have androgenic or male hormone activities. And uh, the pills that are available today, the different variations, um, either change up the progestin component or uh, uh, give it in varying amounts throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, typical cycle. The pill is typically taken for 21 days, uh, followed by seven days on, and then a, a period usually ensues. There are different variations to the standard regimen. 24 days on, four days off, 26 days on, two days off. Monophasics, meaning that the amount of hormones are, are the same for all 21 days. Biphasic, we change it more akin to the idea was let's, um, simulate a normal cycle in a female and triphasics there again. We're just changing the amounts throughout the three-week period. <laughs> Currently available in the United States, 62 monophasic pills, 30 multiphasic, three extended, and seven progestin only. So what's that? Oh, it's about uh, 102 different pills, so there's a lot of variety in the United States. Um, and uh, like I said, it is a very, very big um, business. These are just talking about how you can give hormones to women today through injection, through a patch, through a vaginal ring, through an implant, or the IUD. When it's taken correctly, it's very effective at preventing pregnancy. However, when taken typically by your typical 16-year-old um, or 20-year-old or 30-year-old, we see a pregnancy rate uh, approaching 8%. 
the hill is felt to be, you know, reversible. However, as we're going to discuss later, there are a couple areas where this may not prove to be true. And I think this is where informed consent with oral contraception needs to really take uh, be front and center with these women who are being counseled to go on the pill. Um, ovulation seems to be restored within a um, month or two after ending. This, this is pretty hard to, to, to see. This is the, the, the uh, contraceptive effectiveness. And the reason I bring this up, and I, I know Dr. Nicholson's going to talk about this, the only problem I have with this whole chart is fertility awareness method, so natural family planning, Creighton method, Billings operation method, Marquette method. You know, in perfect use, 0.4 to 5% uh, to you know, pregnancy rate. Typical use, 24. I just disagree. I think that this number is so outdated and old, and I know that Dr. Nicholson's going to talk about this, but, uh, but this is what um, medical students and residents uh, and quite frankly most of my colleagues are believing like oh that, the effectiveness that's that's uh, that's uh, the rhythm method that's that's uh, Vatican roulette you know um, all those you know remarks when it comes to that and it's, just, it's just not uh, it's just not a valid one and I wish they would um, I wish they would update it. So how does it work? Historically, we've talked about three mechanisms attributed to modern combined hormonal con contraception in regards to its mechanism of action. Remember the, the change in definition, and I think it'll become apparent why that change was made. We think about these three mechanisms. We think of inhibits ovulation. It alters the cervical mucus. It makes it thick, <coughs> and it impairs implantation. Now, if you look in the back of the PDR, it'll say nidation. It impairs nidation. Nidation is the burrowing in of the, the uh, fertilized uh, egg, the embryo. So let's talk about inhibit, inhibition of ovulation. This is mainly a progestational effect. It inhibits, for the medical people in the room, it inhibits the LH surge. LH surge typically triggers ovulation. It also suppresses the release of the uh, releasing hormone and thereby decreasing FSH, thereby leading to a, a decrease in the development of follicles which hold the egg. Um, it should be noted that as we've been, I told you, every, you know, the, the main push has been to, to decrease the dose uh, of the pill, that the effect of inhibiting ovulation um, is becoming less and less, right? And back uh, in a paper written by a doc, a Dr. Don Gambrell, he reported, um, in, 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 in his paper, he reported a breakthrough ovulation rate of 14% on a 50-mic on a pill, which would be considered, by today's standards, a high-dose pill. So 14% breakthrough ovulation. That means that 14% of the time, women on the pill are releasing an egg. The second mechanism is alteration of the cervical mucus. And, you know, there has been a, a lot of studies done, and most of fertility awareness programs are centered around a woman's ob uh, observations of the cervical mucus. The mucus is the key. We call it, it, it serves as a, as a gate to the egg, to the ovum, and a window to a woman's fertility, right? 
So it allows us to predict uh, with great certainty the time of ovulation. So that when the mucus is gone, the gate is closed and the curtains are drawn. And one of the effects of the birth control pill is to diminish a woman's fertile mucus, to make it thick, hostile, non-receptive to its main function, which is sperm transport and nutrition. And there was some really, really interesting data put out by Dr. Eric Odomai, sort of the father of mucus, uh, and he was the, uh, what I what I found really intriguing about uh, Dr. Odomai was that he did such intricate studies on the the uh, cervical anatomy, and he he basically uh, would. Uh, did mapping of the cervix and he came up with um, various cervical types that we're going to talk about a little bit later that produce, have different functions in a woman's cervix. And it was uh, Dr. Otobot who said that indeed some of these effects brought on by the birth control pill may be permanent and we may be seeing that in uh, impaired fertility down the road. The third mechanism, in pairs and plantation, it's, uh, you know, the manufacturers, the scientists, we all agree that this is, uh, is happening. What we don't agree on, and what's very difficult for anybody to stand up and say with any amount of certainty, is how often is it happening. There are mathematical models where you can take, remember we, we took that 14% uh, breakthrough ovulation rate and an 8% observed typical pregnancy rate. And then there's the 6%, that's the difference. Where, where did they go? What happened? How were they, how were they, um, prevented. And that's where I think some of the, the numbers that we'll talk about, especially this number at the bottom, which as you can see is a huge range. It's estimated that between 100,000 and 1.6 billion embryos are lost secondary to impaired implantation. And so if someone stood up and said, Dr. Lawler, prove that. I, I mean, there's no studies that's going to that I can quote, basically they're, they're, it, it's basic mathematics based on, um, on what we know the uh, breakthrough ovulation rate is and what we see in the uh, observed pregnancy rate. So when you sit around in a room of statisticians, uh, the conversation not only is quite boring, but um, it's uh, confusing as well. Um, so, let's move to the proposed benefits of the pill. And if there are any statisticians in the room or people who just love stats, I'm going to talk to you after this talk because this is the biggest, uh, if you ever read any paper in the medical journals today, they'll come out and they'll say, Yes, the pill is, um, uh, causes problems, that it causes blood clots, and uh, we know that. And then they'll say, but, but, the pill is safer than pregnancy. And that's the mantra that goes over and over again. And when you look at it statistically, and they show you the numbers, which I'll show you in the room, it's true. However, I think, they're not comparing apples to apples. I really think that they are cherry picking their numbers and to, to benefit the, in order to make that statement. And I think that if we did a, a, a closer look um, at those numbers that this statement um, could be refuted. 
Improves pain from periods, no doubt. Improves pain from endometriosis, documented. Increases the incidence of ovarian and endometrial cancer, colorectal Documented. Improves acne in some, sure enough. Menstrual migraines in some, there again. Irregular menstrual bleeding, sure. Improves uh, PMS in some. Improves bone mets, bone mineral density, so osteoporosis makes menses more predictable. We see this all the time around uh, the, the, the people don't want to have their period on their, women don't want to have their period on their wedding night or, or their vacation, and so they'll try to hormonally manipulate their cycle to fit their lifestyles. So, it should be noted that aside from the reduction in ovarian and endometrial cancer, which have been chunky significant and persist after discontinuation, that the other reported benefits of hormonal suppression disappear after you remove the hormonal suppression. So that, put another way, if a woman has endometriosis and she has painful periods and you put her on the pill, and her periods get better, and she's on the pill for five years, and you take her off the pill, her endometriosis is still there, and it's, her painful periods are going to come back. And the question is, is during that period of time, what's been happening to the tubal architecture, the, the, the reproductive organs, are we treating anything with the pill? Or are we just masking symptoms and making uh, a young woman feel better, potentially, and maybe not, but not really addressing the issue? And that's, uh, I think you know where I stand on it. I think, you know, we need to address the issue. And although this isn't a talk on endometriosis, I'm a surgeon, I feel endometriosis is a surgical disease. And that we want to treat it surgically and get rid of it. Oh. Coming up. Five minutes, you got to take a five minute warning. Risk. <laughs> Holy cow. The risk. Uh, DVTs, four times more likely. Just remember those numbers. 13 million. MI, double, stroke. Double cervical cancer increased. That's just another way of, of saying that. I thought I had the whole morning talk. <laughs> just a, a couple things when it comes to cervical cancer. We used to think, well, okay, the, the reason the association with the pill and cervical cancer was more partners, more HPV, more cancer. However, the change in cervical mucus makes it more likely that any carcinogens will become in contact with the cells longer, thereby promoting cervical cancer. Um, Dr. LaFranc, she's going to talk about the breast cancer uh, data, and it's intriguing. It's, it's hard to get your head around it because so many uh, studies come out and say there's a, uh, there's a real but uh, a significant but small increase in breast cancer. I tend to disagree. I think that this article by Dr. Johnson should you know, make us all pause about um, uh, the diagnosis of breast cancer in the very, very young. In the very, very young, it's, it's, it's more aggressive and more fatal. A friend of mine, good neurologist in the the audience tonight brought this to my attention. This is going to be a, a, a study that's going to be uh, uh, presented at the American College of Neurology. Take home message, women who had used combined hormonal contraception, 35% more likely to develop multiple sclerosis. Yeah, so side effects, just real quickly, these are the, the known side effects. Sounds like a recipe for romance, huh? Great <laughs> <laughs> bleeding, bloating, weight gain, breast tenderness, decreased libido, irritability, depression. Yeah. <laughs> I 
wish I had time to talk about the sort of review because uh, it, it, it's really intriguing data and I had really cool graphs, but Bob is going to panic me and fall down. <laughs> so this is basically, if anyone ever, I, basically what happens is these S trips, which are are uh, essential for fertile mucus, are diminished on can fill users. They're increased in pregnancy, a natural state, and they decrease as we get older. So the pill causes uh, uh, an increased, uh, accelerated aging of the pill. Decreased libido, we can talk about that a little bit later, but this is one of the side effects that may not be reversible. The numbers might not come back to baseline after being on the pill. Contraindications, everybody, those are pretty standard. The grand finale. The pill recently turned 50. Is this an occasion for celebration or reevaluation? The pill had been touted by many to be the one single most important discovery in medical history. It was going to be the answer to so many of societal problems. The world was threatened by overpopulation, poverty, and famine. The pill was going to change all these things for the better. The sexual revolution was in full swing. Don was the outdated notion that the conjugal act served two main purposes, unitive and procreative, or as Dr. Janet Smith had said, for babies and bodies. Now the pleasurable attributes of sexual intimacy could, could be separated from the reproductive. The proponents of the pill stated, this is going to support, strengthen marriage, the threat of another malfunction would be vanquished, women are going to be able to enter the, the workforce, gain equality, and never again be held back by unwanted pregnancy. Abortion was going to be drastically decreased because now every child would be a wanted child. So in retrospect, how have we done? Is the world a better place? Are we healthier? Are we not here? Are we more fulfilled? And what does the next 50 years hold? So in that, I do with you. Dr. Lawler for a very interesting talk. Why don't we take two questions and then we'll move forward into the rest of the field. There's two uh, microphones. Actually, if you do have a question, there's a microphone there and here, and that way the whole audience could hear you. And we'll start with Dr. Zabiega, a great friend of the Institute. Uh, I'm a neurologist, so I'm going to sort of ask a question, but also sort of uh, say something about the multiple sclerosis which is the most disabling disease, specifically most among young women. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that we've known for years that pregnancy prevents it and improves it. So when, when a woman is pregnant, we don't have to give her any medications. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the new study proves also that if you, if you don't have uh, multiple sclerosis, you have babies. If you want to have multiple sclerosis, <laughs> use contraception. The other thing that actually I disagree with about the fact that I don't think the birth control pill helps menstrual minders at all. In fact, I see the opposite. Mm -hmm. I see women who I take off of uh, uh, birth control pills, and, and then their pegs actually improve. I do want to ask a question. What is your, I've, I've seen a lot of women who are on Mirena IUDs, and oftentimes they don't even report that as a medication, so that's sort of required if, they, if they're on something else. And I've seen a lot of patients who, even when they've been on Mirena IUD for years, five, six, seven years, and they had no problems. And then suddenly, later on, they come in with, I had one woman recently, eight years on her an IUD, said she had these horrible daily headaches. And I told her to go off of her IUD. I gave her, I didn't have any data to find, I could only find data on blogs, so I printed out something from a blog. She, she, she took, she had the her IUD taken out, and the next time she came in, was only to thank me because her headaches were completely gone. So I don't know if you've, you've seen that or not, but why is it that the long, even it can occur at any time, not even at the beginning? Well, I think, Tom, it's a, it's a, if you think about when he was asking about the Marina IUD, which is a progesterone impregnated IUD um, that is good for three years, typically, um, and the untoward effects are just 
the, the consistent, constant exposure to a foreign body, um, it's not it, it, it's, it's not too far fetched to think that over time that's going to present problems. And it does, and that, and then the other big problem with the idea of sort of is migration through the uh, uterine wall, uh, which makes removal quite uh, quite difficult. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Nancy, and I am a gastro studies student at Catholic Theological Union. Um, I have an interesting tidbit. Um, my daughter was conceived here at U University of Illinois. Uh, her birth parents went to University of Illinois. She is now a medical student, uh, pre-med at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, when she went away to college, she's a freshman. Um, a friend of mine, Carmen, said, Nancy, you know, before you send your daughter off to school, you got to put her on the pill. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> well, you tell me than that. <laughs> she was raised Catholic. She went to St. Mary of the Woods in Chicago, and she is totally against the HPV, or whatever that is. Um, and now she's a freshman, and what does she call the, the business school? Uh, uh, she's with an architectural kid. Oh, she calls the B-School preschool kids who play basketball at 3 o'clock in the morning and do whatever. Um, do you have a daughter? <laughs> do I? Yeah. Uh, yes. Four. Four daughters. Four daughters. Um, there's six in my family. I'm one of five uh, girls and one boy. Do you have a son? Seven. <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> Not extra, uh, sexually active, nor does she want to be until she finishes her degree and gets married. What do you tell? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, honestly, I uh, I would no more hand um, a woman a pack of cigarettes than I would the pill. That's just my my feelings at, after time. That um, and I think when you when you sit down and you talk to these. Uh, young girls uh, who have various reasons for wanting to go, are, are thinking they want to go on the pill. Um, I, I, I just don't think as the medical community that we're taking enough time to explain exactly what you're doing. What are you doing? And, and to think that that you can, you know, chronically uh, override the normal physiologic state induce a state of pseudo-pregnancy, so to speak, and have no untoward consequences, I, I just think it's folly. I don't think, you know, and I don't think it's good medicine. Um, the components of the pill, you know, are fine, but, but the, it's, it's the, the potency and the duration of use, and then there's the whole, you know, problem with contraception. Dr. Waller, thanks so much for advancing the talk.